is a geotechnical, environmental, and geoforensic uh, seminar for residential foundations. And uh, let's see. And if you need to reach me for some reason, you can contact me. Uh, my contact information is David Eastwood. Uh, email is de at geotecheng.com. I got a question here. We can hear. Let's see, you've got chat here. Good afternoon. Everybody can hear me then. That's good. So that's my contact information if you need to reach me for any reason. Audience, uh, we have about 320 people RSVP'd. And uh, we got a lot of engineers, a lot of builders, architects, people from the government, Harris County, so Houston. And so we got a lot of people. So this presentation, of course, is gonna be directed towards the, the builders and, and engineers because we got a lot of engineers here. A little bit about our company, Geotech Engineering and Testing. Uh, we're located in Houston. We've been around for 35 years. We do geotechnical, environmental materials and geoforensics. We have a staff of 60 engineers, geologists, technicians, and we work all over Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and we do have our own rigs so we can get on your projects quickly. That's what a lot of people like us because I can put a rig on a project the next day. Uh, if you have any questions, please type in your questions. There's a Q&A, little button on your, on, on your screen. So please type it in, don't put it in chat, chat, but put it in Q&A. So we're gonna be talking about residential foundations. These are some pictures that were sent to me by some people. When back in the old days, look at the guys, the way they, they used to live out there in, in, the, in the mountains. And of course, this guy here has to come this way to go in. You got a tree house, house out there in the middle of the ocean. And of course, back to Sugarland, Telfair. And of course, so when you develop a piece of property, you wanna build a house, uh, you go, go out there and uh, cut all the trees, of course. Uh, then you go out there and start putting your streets in, underground utilities and uh, your detention. And then you got a subdivision. So it's a lot of work, a lot of stuff. You go all the way from site clearing to mass grading to underground utilities to paving, foundations, earthwork, framing, detention ponds. So there's a lot that goes into it. One of the first things when you uh, develop a piece of property is a uh, phase one environmental site assessment. So if you uh, you develop a piece of property to build a subdivision or not necessarily houses, but subdivisions. You do a phase one environmental site assessment with that tra track of land. And, uh, you know, you go out there, if there's an old service station out there, they got these old storage tanks that they leak. And if they leak out there and uh, the groundwater gets contaminated and goes to your land, you're responsible for all the cleanup costs, get all the soils contaminated, the, the, the groundwater contaminated. And so uh, make sure, uh, you know, you do a phase one. Some of these barrels over here that could be leaking, cause contamination. You're gonna have some uh, gas wells and, and, and uh, you're gonna have some pipelines here that could be leaking. And if the pipeline leaks and bursts and contaminates your house or your subdivision, you are responsible for the cleanup costs and. You got to probably sue to get paid from the, the other guys who caused it. If you're in League City and you got these tank farm here and uh, this area here gets all contaminated, uh, you know, you got to check for phase one to make sure that this area is not contaminated. If you want to develop this area here for subdivision, do not build next to, of course, landfills. If you do, make sure uh, the landfill is not contaminating soils and groundwater. You know, all this waste over here. When it rains, water, you know, you know, leaches all this material and gets into the soil and groundwater system called leachates, and uh, and of course contaminates soils and groundwater. Uh, you also worry about if you're out there in, in the midtown area or in, in uh, 
heights. You know, those areas have got some of these old structures and you got to worry about asbestos and, 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 uh, and so if you have asbestos or you got lead, 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 lead based paint, those guys can cause contamination. So you got to have to check for those things before you do a tear down and, and want to build a house or a subdivision or a multi multifamily type structures. So you cannot do or build or any, anything out there on, you know, in the cemeteries. Uh, if you're building next to a, of course, cleaners, some of these cleaners, they've got underground storage tanks where they got the chemicals that wash clothes with, you know, they got carcinogens, these chemicals, cancer causing. And if they get into the soil and groundwater system, it can cause contamination. So you got to watch out for the cleaners. Uh, if this is a site out there in Pasadena, out there near Red Bluff, and, uh, you know, it was 19, uh, this is a 1938 uh, picture of aerial photo, 1938, and then you got 1944, uh, they built the subdivision here, and you can see at 1989, you got service stations, cleaners, car wash, service station, gas station, and a chemical plant next to the subdivision can cause contamination on the land here. Here's a piece of track out there in the Heights. This track uh, near North Main here in 1925 had one house on it. In 1969, they had a service station here. That service station contaminated the soils here. So when we did a phase one, we had to go back and check it to a phase two and find a bunch of contamination out there on the soils. They had to haul it all off. So there was contamination. So when you do a phase one, you try to find the risk-based analysis. You see all these facilities around it can cause contamination on your site over here. We go and check one mile radius. And so we check for oil wells, you know, these are the oil wells around this track right there. You know, you got all these oil wells. And of course, when you have oil wells, you got oil pits. Oil pits, you know, of course, cause a lot of contamination. Uh, you get a table like this that shows what's out there. You know, like leaky underground storage tanks. You got one of them within one eighth of the mile of the project, one within one eighth to one fourth. Total of 14 of them within a mile of the project, leaky underground storage tanks. You got underground storage tanks, you got 12 of them within one mile of the project. So it's a risk-based analysis and you go out there and you do a phase one, you do a site visit, regulatory agency check, historical review, interviews. And based on that, you determine if there's a risk. If there's a structure out there, you check for asbestos, lead base paint, and then you get into a phase two if you want to if there's a risk of contamination. When you do a phase two environmental site assessment, it's in according to 19, ASTM in 1903. And, uh, you know, when you go out there and start finding a bunch of chemicals out there on your property that you're looking at, and uh, these contaminations, you know, you go out there and start digging, you find out a bunch of contaminated soils. Like you, you see on the east of Houston out there on 225 area, east of downtown. A lot of industrial facilities out there. So when you are developing out there, you got a lot of these, you know, contaminated pipeline, leakage. Here's another site here. They got contamination right there. Contamination cause, of course, uh, damage to wildlife, wellhead. Here's a project on Cypress Wood. Uh, when we do the phase one, we did not pick up this wellhead. And uh, when they were clearing the site, we saw this out there. Nobody had record of it. So we had to go back and do a bunch of testing to make sure it's not contaminated. Remediation, if your site is contaminated, the one way of treating the area is dig out the contaminated soils, stockpile it, cover it with uh, plastic so it doesn't leach into the soil and groundwater, put it in a uh, specific uh, containers and take it to an industrial uh, landfill. Backfill the whole area with the structural fill in lifts, compact 95%. Wetlands. 
Uh, you got to watch worry about wetlands, of course. So wetlands are areas that are inundated to saturated with surface or groundwater at frequency and duration sufficient to support and under normal circumstances do support a prevalence, prevalence of vegetation typically occur in, in a wetland condition, a saturated condition. Wetlands include, include swamps, marshes, bogs, and similar areas. Of course, is regulated by U.S. Corps of Engineers. Here are some pictures of the wetlands. We got wetlands in Harris County, Montgomery County, lots of it in Galveston County, Brazoria County, Fort Bend County, all the areas that we're developing, Waller County. So you got to check for wetlands. These are some, you know, you can see where the water used to be up to. Here's Galveston. See a lot of wetland there. That's Leake City out there, Leake, Galveston County. We build the houses over here. We left this alone here. These are typical vegetation occur in a wetland environment. See another area where it's wetland here, of course. See the trees are inundated. So how do I know I've got a wetland, jurisdiction of water, uh, jurisdiction of delineation to see if you got a wetland out there uh, or basically uh, in order to delineate it, according to U.S. Uh, uh, delineate which waters of the U.S. and are therefore subject to Clean Water Act 404. Most often, a preliminary jurisdictional delineation is submitted to the Corps of Engineers. You fill out a small application and they tell you uh, if likely for it to be a wetland or not. And then you can follow through but based on that. Wetland delineations are conducted in accordance with the 1987 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual. To have wetlands, of course, you're going to have water, certain plants that grow in a wetland environment, and you have to have soils, the hydric soils. These soils smell like rotten eggs, and uh, you know they've been underwater for a long time, so these are hydric soils. You have to have water-loving vegetation and wetland hydrology. Okay, we got some questions here. Uh, let's see. Let's go back again. We got a question. Are copies of the slides available for distribution? No, you can get not get copies of the slides, but you can get a copy of the presentation. The presentation is being recorded. So you can get a copy of the presentation, but not the slides. Subsidence. Subsidence is a lowering of elevation of the land over time. Subsidence can have a wide range of consequences depending on the location of the occurrence and its proximity to the surface drainage. In this area, clay compaction resulting from groundwater removal is the primary cause of subsidence. So, you know, areas have subsidence issues. You take the groundwater out, the area starts dropping. We have these aquifers in the Houston area, Chico aquifer, you know, about 700 feet deep, 1,000 feet. You go all the way to Jasper, 4,000, 5,000 feet deep. And these are bodies of sand. You, you basically, they're full of water. You dig out the, you put wells in them and you try to take that water out. The ground starting dropping. These are the aquifers that go all the way down to seven, 10,000 feet deep. This is Humboldt, this is Galveston. So these, these are big bodies of sand that under Houston. So as you put a well in there and you take the groundwater out for use, the area starts dropping, it's called subsidence. This is Goose Creek oil field out there. And you can see right over here near San Jacinto Bay, used to be above ground, but it dropped three feet and it's now underwater. You can see this like here, the areas that of course are subsiding, they experience flooding. This is a wellhead in Baytown. Initially it was right there at the grade, now the ground subsided and you can see the void there. There's a gap. This is Kingwood flooding due to subsidence. You can see all these pictures, Brownwood subdivision. This is Brownwood right here near Baytown. 1944, 1953 started 
2012. So you can see as the area starts going down, it gets inundated by water, it's flooded. This is a basically subsidence in Houston area between 1906 and 1987. You can see near ship channel, it dropped as much as nine feet. And this is not elastic, it's just not gonna come back up again. This is a recent uh, subsidence map. Look at Montgomery County. It's dropping at a rate of about six, one, but, but, but one half an inch, half, a, half an inch a year, 16 millimeter a year is dropping. And of course, uh, this is a predicted uh, subsidence between 1995, 2030. And you can see the area, for example, northwest part of Houston can drop as much as five feet if you don't go to a surface water system. And of course, uh, we got all these surface water systems, the North Water, Harris County Water Authority, West Houston Water Authority, North Fort Bend Water Authority, San Jacinto River Authority. Um, so we've gone to surface water, but still we got issues here. Attics area dropping you know, like half an inch a year. Pasadena, this is compaction as a function of years. It's leveling off, it's not dropping as much because we're not using groundwater as much. Faulting, if you got part of town that's dropping to subsidence, another part of town that's not dropping as a result of subsidence, um, there are cracks that have been in the ground for millions of years. These cracks have been activated, gets activated because of the subsidence. They're called faults. These faults can extend 200 feet deep. They activate, they're moved about half an inch a year. And uh, there's about 300 of them in the Houston Corpus Christi area. They move about half an inch a year. Here's a fault line going through this house. This is the upthrown section. This is the downthrown section. This is what we call the shear zone here. So you build a house out there on top of the fault or near the fault, it's going to have all kinds of cracks in it. Upthrown section, downthrown section. Fault going this way. Here's the fault going like that. House is cracking up. It's a hall, the house on top of the fault. Out there in the woodlands area, there's Carlton Woods. And you can see the fault going towards this structure house over there. Here's the lineation of a fault going towards the parking lot, cracking it, going towards that structure. Here's a bump here in the road, this fault. He's out there post Oak fault. Uh, fault's got an upthrown section and a downthrown section. Downthrown section is where it's dropping. These are layers of soil. So you got clay, sand, clay. So as it drops, these layers go out of whack. So you can do borings out here and here, see how, how much out of whack it is and determine where the fault line is. This is the fault scarp in here. Looking at aerial photos, you can see the fault right there. This is the downthrown section, it's the upthrown section. Downthrown section when it gets darker. Um, it's more water, so it's darker than the upthrown section. So it gets more water. Again, you see the lineation of the fault from aerial photo. It's the downthrown section, it's the upthrown section. Here's lineation, downthrown, you got water standing, upthrown. So, one way you can tell if you got a fault is by looking at fault maps, looking at aerial photos, going out there and looking at the site. This is called a phase one fault study. So we recommend that on any time you buy a project, build a subdivision or something, check for faulting. Sometimes you cannot see the fault because the site is wooded. And if your site is wooded or it's got tall grass on it, you can't tell necessarily where the fault line is. In that case, you would be using LIDAR. LIDAR uses laser light to measure distance. You send the LIDARs are from like airplane out there and you can see the changing elevations. And use the fault line right there. This is a fault line right there on the LIDAR map. 
So that was our property in here. And that's where the fault's going right through it. Our faults in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. The faults in San Antonio, Austin, and Dallas are not active. Um, the soils across the fault line are different. So if you build out there, you got to make sure you got detailed soil testing. Because one side is all clay, the other side is sand. Uh, in the golf course area, that's where a lot of active faults are, where they start, they, they move. Here is some fault maps. By the way, these fault maps are on our website. You can go download them if you want to. Here's fault lines. You can see there's little uh, arrows in here. This is the downthrown section of fault. This is the upthrown section of the fault. These are the faults in the Houston area. This is a track out there uh, in Pearland that uh, our client wanted to develop. And uh, this is near Makoa, what we call Salt Dome in Pearland. These are the fault lines right there. This is the track of land. This is the pipeline. And here's the fault that going right through it. So what we did here, we turned that into what we call a hazard zone. It's about 130 foot wide. This is the downthrown section, this is the upthrown section. So downthrown section is usually twice as much as the upthrown section because there's more movement in the downthrown section. So if it's, let's say 120 foot wide, the, the downthrown section is, you know, roughly about 80 feet or so. And the upthrown section is 40 feet wide. So you cannot build anything here. You can put a road there, but you cannot build houses. So you can uh, put a detention pond, turn it into a linear park, but you cannot build houses. This is a Montessori school out there on Paradigm Parkway. And they built it near the fault. And uh, we told them not to do it. They did it anyway. They put it on deep piers. These are anchor bolts. This is the beam. You go in there and adjust it every year, any movement to make sure your building is level. Field exploration. When we do soil testing for residential projects, we send one of our rigs out there. These are some of our rigs. We've got about seven rigs. These rigs go about 120 feet deep. These are ATV. These are portable rigs go about 25 foot deep. This guy over here goes 120 foot. So if your site looks like this, nice and dry, we send the rig like this, the truck mounted rig. These are all truck mounted rigs. Your site is wet, you can't get to them. Yeah, so you would use what's called a buggy rig. They got big tires, they go into wet areas, cost more money. If your site is wooded, you gotta clear a path. Like we do a lot of stuff out there in the woodlands area. We clear a path there first. And uh, we do our borings next to the biggest trees on the property. And uh, So I had a question here, I guess I thought I did. I got one question. Hilda, environmental rules have been impacted by executive order during the last administration. Has the administration revoked some of these orders by executive order? I think the, uh, the only thing that I know there was executive order on, of course, was the wetland stuff. And as far as I know that I haven't heard that anything has been changed. It may have, but I have not heard anything. We do most of the borings next to the biggest trees on the property. Trees got root fibers that extend down. That's how you determine the depth of active zone. So when you get the root fibers from the trees, that tells you the depth of active zone. Uh, we have another question here. Okay. Um, we get our, this is a portable rig, of course. You do the boring out there. 
you drive the sampler with this weight into the ground. This is a portable rig, goes down about 25 foot deep, you drill with it. If their site is wet, we go out there and you take our ATV and pull the portable rig behind it and do the borings out there when it's wet, you cannot put a big truck out there. We get our samples with what's called Shelby tube sampler. These are three inch diameter tubes. They're hollow. You push them hydraulically into the soil. You get your soil sample, that's what it looks like. You cut the ends, you put them in foil, give it job number, you take it to the lab. You put it in a box like this, a wax, wax box so that it doesn't lose moisture. You wanna test out your soils within 14 days. We check with root fibers. Root fibers extend to an area where there's oxygen and water and defines your active zone depth. Active zone is a depth at which soils experience shrink and swell. Like in Houston, in areas where you got expansive soils, like Pearland, West University, Bel Air, Tanglewood, all those areas, your active zone is about 10 foot deep. In areas where you got sandy soils, you do a standard penetration test. In this, tense, in this test, you get 140 pound hammer. You drop it 30 inches into the soil. You drive it 18 inches through the soil, six inch, six inch, and six inch. This is a split sampler, split spoon sampler. This is sand. So if your blow counts is between zero and four, you got loose sand. If your blow counts is between five and 10, you got loose, medium dense between 11 and 30. So if you're out there in the woodlands area, your sands are loose, zero to four. In the Bridgeland area, you got loose sand. So that's where you, you, know, you have to design a foundation for loose sand. You start going deeper, you hit rock. We have some rock out there on 105 near Lake Condro out there on the west side. You got sandstone. You go to Huntsville, you got the rock there. You got out there in rock out there near Lake Livingston, out there on, a, on Alaska area. You got a bunch of rock there. You got, of course, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. We have rock in all those three cities. Rocks in Houston are about 2,500 feet deep, 5,000 feet deep. Groundwater, when, you, when you're on the job site, you check for groundwater and to measure the depth where the water you hit. Typically you hit them about 20, 30 feet deep. If you have a lot of rain, you may be shallower. Water table fluctuates. In the summertime it's deep, in the wintertime it's shallow. You put a tape measure with a weight at the end of it. You drop it in the hole when it hits the water, it goes plump and you know where you hit the water. That's how you measure the water level. Perch water table, that's another water table we got. Areas where we got sand or silt or clay like Bridgeland or the Woodlands area, Shenandoah. In these areas, you got sandy soils over clay like in Katy, they have perch water table. Water just sits on top of the clay layer, it doesn't go anywhere. Okay, that's the water table. You dig a little hole and you see it gets filled up with water. This is perch water table. Number of borings. Typically for a custom house, uh, a house like this, you go before you tear it down, we go out and do the borings next to the biggest trees. And, and uh, you do two borings for a 3,000 square foot house. If your footprint is 4,000, 5,000, you do three borings. So you do essentially one boring every 1,500 square foot of the footprint of the house. This is a lot in West U, it's a 50 by 100. So you do a couple of 20 foot borings there, or 25 foot borings. Your boring depths where if you use piers are about 20, 25 foot deep. If you use a post tension slab in Houston is 15 foot. Dallas, San Antonio and Austin is 20 foot. Here's a side here. Uh, you got your pier, you, you got your uh, trees here. You do borings in one, B2 next to the biggest trees on the site before you do the tear down. We'll also do a preliminary study before you buy a piece of property, we check the soils to make sure it's not really expansive. 
Because if you go out there and build a house on top of really expensive soils, you're going to spend a lot of money on foundation. So let's say you want to buy this track in here. You go out and do some borings on it and tell you how bad that soils are. If you have drainage dishes there, if you got problems on the site, bunch of fail. So we check for all that before you buy the property. Borings, you got to do one boring every 10 acres when you do feasibility study. Lot borings, we do a lot of lot borings for builders. If you got a subdivision, you got builder one, builder two. The blue is one builder, red is another builder. And uh, we go out there and split the borings between them. We do one boring every four lots, like this. However, soils vary between the lots. Soils vary inside one lot itself. In other words, if you do two borings on a lot, a lot of times the soils are different. So when we do borings on a subdivision like this, we take the worst borings and design the foundation based on the worst boring. So you do some boring, sometimes with some builders, we do one boring every 200 feet. With some other builders, we do one every lot. With some builders, we do one every 100 foot spacing. Okay, which you recommend for a house slab on piers or post tension? On houses on piers, you got to do two borings minimum 20 feet deep on that lot. Every lot that you got piers, you got to do borings on. For post tension, you got to do at least one every four lots. And we're finding out that really you got to do one every lot because the soils very much. Here's a kingwood in here. We're doing borings out there next to the trees for post tension slab. You just back it up to the tree line and do the borings. Lavatory testing. We get our soil samples. The next thing is to test the soil in the lab. One of the tests we do in the lab is called liquid limit test. In this test, we want to know how much water we should add to the soil for it to become liquid. So you add a bunch of soil, water to the soil here, mix it up when it becomes liquid, you put it in a cup like this, you cut a groove through it. And you turn this handle 20 times to 30 times and take a sample of this. You get the wet weight of it on a scale. And then you put it in the oven and dry it up and you get the dry weight of it. So the difference between the wet weight and the dry weight is how much water is in that soil. These are plastic limit tests. In this test, you take the soil sample, you roll it to one eighth of an inch. You want to know how much water is in that soil is in the soil for it to behave semi-plastic. You put it in this scale and get the wet weight of it. You put it in the oven, you get the dry weight of it. You want to know how much water is in the soil for it to behave semi-plastic. The difference between liquid limit and plastic limit is plasticity index or PI. So your PI is less than 20, you got low, low swell potential. Between 20 and 30, it's got mildly expansive. Between 30 and 40, it's highly expansive. Above 40 is very high. A couple of other tests we do in the laboratory is called hand penetrometer and torvane. In a hand penetrometer test, we take the soil sample like this and push this into it. You can read what kind of a strength it has. In a torvane, you put it at the end of the sample, you shear it in torsion. You can read here what kind of a strength it has. You can do unconfined compression tests as well. These are all for foundation design, the design of the bearing capacity for your foundations, for your underground utilities and paving. You put the sample here, you put the uh, load ring, deflect, your, this is a load, uh, load the gauge, and here's a deflection gauge. You shear the sample, see how much load it takes to crack the soil. Soil types in Houston area, we have lots of clay. It's a clay site, sand. You go to Galveston, you get a bunch of sand. This is a sandy site. Silt, we got a bunch of silt out there in the Woodlands area, Bridgeland area, Katy area. The grain size of the silt uh, is bigger than clay, but smaller than sand, really hard material to build on. 
So we got clay, you go deeper, you get orange clay. You go deeper, you get white clay. You get rock. And you got fill. So a lot of times you go buy lots out there after mass grading out there, they got a lot of fill on these lots. You can build on top of the lots on fill. As long as it's properly compacted, make sure you got density test for every lift for the, uh, for the fill. Every lift is eight inches. So if your fill is, you know, four feet th thick, so that's four times 12, that's 48 inches. So that's, that's multiple lifts. So 48 over eight, is that, what is that, six? That's six lifts. You need to have densities for every lift, six lifts. And the fill should be free of organics, no roots and stuff in it. Should be nicely compact, 95% standard proctor density. Engineering analysis in Houston area and in Texas, we've got a lot of expansive soils. In general, Texas got variable soil conditions. So you need a soil test. If you're doing a building a house or a subdivision, good chunk of US experience expansive soils. And you can see the expansive soils, soils that can basically expand up about 1500%. You have the expansive soil areas. Lots of expansive soils in Texas. In Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, we've got a lot of expansive soils. Of course, the expansive soils that are in Dallas and San Antonio and Austin are worse than Houston because the depth of active zone in, uh, in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin is deeper than that's what's in Houston. It's all because of the rainfall and climatic condition. So if you got an oak tree that is in Houston, that oak tree is gonna get taller in Houston because there's got more water in it than Dallas and San Antonio. In Dallas and San Antonio and Austin, the trees are short, a lot shorter than Houston because there's not enough water. So if you go around Houston, for example, the reason I talk about the Dallas, San Antonio and all of them is because we got a lot of people here that are coming from San Antonio and Dallas and Austin on this presentation. So I'm kind of talking to them as well. If you go around Houston, you start with where I live, which is near Roman Forest, Splendora. You got sandy clay over here and then Roman Forest becomes sand, a lot of trees. Kingwood, it turns to gumbo. Lots of gumbo clays and trees. You go to Tascacita, it becomes sandy over gumbo clays and trees. You go to Dayton, Mont Bellevue, Baytown, Laporte, Pasadena, Galena Park, Channel View, highly expansive soils, things move around. South Houston, Pearland, Missouri City, Sugarland, New Territory, Rosenberg, highly expansive soils. You go to Cinco Ranch, the soils become sandy. Oh, sand over clay, it's low PI soils, non expansive, Bridgeland, far, far field. Lots of faults out there near the fair, Fairfield area. Uh, so these areas become sandy soils. Tomball has got gumbo clays and you got sandy soils as well. Kind of a mixture of all kinds of different soils in Tomball. You go inner city, you go Westview, Bel Air, Tanglewood, Myerland, you got highly expansive soils, a lot of attorneys and trees. You go to heights, you got sandy clay soils, moderately expansive soils. One of the things you have to worry about, of course, is called potential vertical rise, PVR. When you build somewhere, PVR is a potential heave at a specific site in inches. So this is a map I developed for Houston. If you go out there and build in Webster, it's five inches of PVR. You go to League City, it's six, seven inches. You go to Friendswood, Great wood, six inches. Rosenberg, about five inches. Full share, about two to four inches. You go Brookshire, about one and a half inches. Bridgeland, about one and a half inches. Fairfield, one and a half inches. Tomball, it could be anywhere to one to four inches. Spring, one and a half. Woodlands, one to four. Kingwood, three to four. You go out there in Westview and Bel Air five, six inches of PVR. So we got a bunch of different soils out there in Houston. 
This guy gives you, of course, a relative number. So you're going to have to do an individual soil test to come up with uh, the PVR. PVR for building houses on piers should be less than to one inch. PVR for post-tension slabs with no piers got to be 4.5 inches or, or lower. Some of the things you can do to reduce the PVR, the heave, is make sure you stop to reduce the ch drastic changes uh, by placing a sprinkler system around the whole slab. So if you have sprinkler system everywhere and keep the moisture uniform, you don't go from a total dry to total wet or from a total wet to a total dry. You make your de beams deeper, uh, the deeper your beam is, uh, the less moisture going underneath your slab, less movement. When you put dryways, you don't butt them against the great beams. You put a space between the dryway and the slab. Keep the moisture uniform around the slab. Here, this is dry, this is wet. So it's going to move around here. It doesn't move here. So you're going to get differential movement because of the, the, the basically change of moisture. Positive drainage. You want to have 5% drainage around the house. Make sure you don't use sand underneath your forms. If you got expansive soils, when you use sand, and these sands transmits the water to areas where trees were taken out, that whole slab starts moving and you're going to have foundation problems. So backfill your forms with select fill or structural fill. Select fill is a soil with liquid limit less than 40 PI between 12 and 20. Structural fill, of course, is not sand or silt. It's sandy clay or clay. You can use structural fill on any post tension slab. We designed for it. Uh, you can remove the expansive soils and put non expansive soils. So you can remove it. If you got a site with a PI of 60 and a PDR of four inches, you need about seven foot of soil to get the PVR to less than one inch. Not practical. Got a question. Okay, somebody asking, what about landscaping irrigation behind the curbs that can cause differential movements of pavements near the, any general recommendations? Obviously, uh, you know, these, uh, these pavements that we're designing, uh, you know, we design them put them right on top of the ground. So any moisture underneath them that gets there is gonna cause pavement movement. And so going out there and lime stabilizing, it does not necessarily preventing it from movement. Pavements, pavements are floating systems. They move if the ground moves. So, and of course it affects the rideability of them. So uh, we have a whole presentation on pavements if you wanna to listen to them. That's gonna be coming up one of these days. So when you got expansive soils, like let's say you're near Astrodome out there, that ground really shrinks during the summertime and develops shrinkage cracks. The shrinkage cracks, uh, they get filled up with uh, debris during the summertime. They get filled up with you know sand and silts and stuff. And then you get a bunch of rain and it starts heaving up because it's expansive soils. And it does that, it cracks the soils at 45 degree angle. This is called slick insides. That's where the failure occurs. So if you go out and excavating for your drill piers, your soils are hard, but the whole side of the pier is gonna collapse because of the slick insides. If you're building a pool, the soils are hard, but side of the pool is going to collapse because of the slick inside. So, so if you go look at the geologic map of Houston area, north of Buffalo Bayou, we got what's called a leasy formation. This is sandy soils, sands and silts and stuff like that. Below that, you got Beaumont formation, which basically sandy clays and clays and gumbo soils. This is a boring log from zero to two feet. You got fill, it's fat clay. 
You got a plasticine index of 38, strength of 1,000 PSF, 1,500. Below that, you got fat clay, gumbo clay, to about 13 feet. Below that, you got sand. Initially, when we drilled it, we hit the water at 13 feet. But with time, the hydrostatic pressure in the sand pushed the water to about nine feet. The clay here has got a PI of 35, 39, strength of about 1,500 PSF. This is called a boring log. These are different boring logs out there along the street. You can see from elevation 30 to elevation 18, you got clay. That's 12 foot of clay. Below that, you got sand. Below that, you got clay. So if you want to have a pier foundation, uh, if your soils are non-expansive, you put the pier above the sand. If your soils are expansive, your pier is going to go below the sand. You got to use a slurry method of construction to build those piers. The kind of foundations that we have in the Houston area, got drill piers, deep foundations, drill piers, piling, auger cast piles, helical piles, press piling, floating systems like conventional reinforcer slab or reinforcer slab, post tension slab, spread footings and mats. These are the kind of foundations we use in the Houston area in Texas anyway. When you do a custom home project, you got to discuss the foundation with the homeowner. The best type of foundation is a structural slab with piers. Let's say that's $26 a square foot. Next best one is a slab on fill on piers. Next best one is a floating slab supported on piers, a stiffened slab on piers. This thing is can go up, but it cannot go down because it's got piers, it cannot go down. Slab on fill on piers. On this one here, we calculate how much fill you need to get the PVR to less than one inch. Sometimes you need five foot of fill, sometimes you need six foot of fill. Next one is a floating super slab, post tension or conventional slab. So this one super slab system is kind of slab that does not need any compaction. You take the great beams into natural soils and you design a six inch slab that spans the two. So uh, that's a floating slab. The next thing is a floating slab foundation, like a post tension slab or a conventional reinforcer slab. These foundations perform fine as long as you got proper construction and proper maintenance. Most of the houses around Houston are built on a floating slab system, which could be a post tension slab or a conventional reinforcer slab. 95% of the houses are built on a floating slab. Dear drill piers, you got an auger rig. You got a reamer in here. You drill the holes with the auger. This is the bell. You open up the bell. You drill the hole, make sure there's not too much water in here. You can have up to two or three inches of water in there. This is the drill pier bell. Steel in it, you get the steel coming up straight. You don't bend the steel. Okay, so you don't bend the steel because you want to allow your grade beams to lift off your piers. So this is the pier, this is the grade beam. You got sleeve in here, you have steel coming up straight. You put the grade beam on top of it, it allows the beam to lift off of it due to expansive soils. You put void boxes in between the piers underneath the grade beams. Make sure you got void boxes everywhere, underneath, everywhere underneath the slab, not just around the exterior. You're going to have to have it everywhere. Here's the makeup in here. You're going to have beams, piers, void boxes underneath everywhere. Here's a slide for engineers in the audience, how you determine pier depths. First, you have to determine the moisture active zone depth. That's usually about two feet below the lowest root fiber, or when you hit a sand layer, when you hit a rock layer, when you get change in suction of less than 0.02 to 7 PF, when liquidity index becomes vertical, depth of slick inside, 
historical water table. So you get the moisture active zone, then you determine what your zero movement line is. You calculate how much load should be there to prevent the soils from moving up and down. In Houston, it's about 1,250 PSF. So this is about 10 foot deep. Your active zone here, a second size can be 20 foot deep. But zero movement line is less than that or equal to it. When you put a pier in it, you're going to have to run it below the zero movement line. This is, a, of course, movement active zone, which is equal to the zero movement line. Anchor zone should be such that the skin friction here equals the skin friction here so that the soil is not gonna lift up the piers off the ground. You don't count the bale when you calculate uplift to resist expansive soils. If you have a tree, your active zone is deeper than where you don't have a tree. So when you put a pre-pier in the ground, you have to worry about compressive load, end bearing and skin friction to keep it from going down. Then you got uplift resistance, you got skin friction here, skin friction here. Oh, you stick it, you know, this skin friction should be equal to this. You don't count on the bell to resist uplift. Pier depths in Bel Air, Westview, Tanglewood, Brace Heights, Myland should be at least 18 feet or deeper. So if you get a soil report that's got a 12 foot pier on it in Westview, you're getting ready for a lawsuit. If you get a pier depth in Tango with less than 20 feet or 18 feet, you got potential lawsuit because that pier is gonna move. So make sure you check that, make sure you're not getting shallow foundations out there in which these areas. These are troubled areas, it's got highly expansive soils, you got trees and you got a bunch of attorneys. So if your active zone is 10 foot deep, your piers are 20 feet in Houston. You go to Dallas, your active zone is eight to 20 feet deep. You go piers going 20, 30 feet deep. You go to Las Colinas, your piers are 50 foot deep. San Antonio, you got a deeper active zone there because lower rainfall, your piers are maybe 60 foot deep in some areas. In Austin, eight to 20 feet deep, 20 foot deep on the piers. So if I'm in West U, you got this tree out here, I've got active zone of 10 foot and PI of 50. Where's the pier gonna go? Well, typically the pier in this area is gonna be about 20 foot deep, twice the active zone. Here the active zone is 10 feet, you got sand. Where's the pier gonna go? About 23, 24 feet because the skin friction in sand is less than clay. So it's got to go deeper. You got to use a slurry method of construction. When you're going out there in West U, Bel Air, Tanglewood, Paraland areas, when you put piers in there and those piers are deep, you got to be ready to use a slurry method of construction. I'm going to talk about that later in the program. You cannot go with a dry method of construction to put your piers in. Don't waste everybody's call time calling, hey, I hit water. Well, you're going to hit water. The report is going to say you're going to use a slurry method of construction. If your soils are expansive in the floor slab areas, you got to use a structural slab with void or you go slab on fill. You fill, calculate the fill such that your PVR is less than one inch. You may have to do chemical injection to reduce your PVR or use non-expansive soils. If your soils are non-expansive soils, like in the woodlands area, you just compact the soils and you put your slab on top of it. So just depending where you are. If I'm out there in West U Bellard, Tanglewood, you know, Pearland, Rosenberg. I'll be looking at structural slab, slab on fill, chemical stabilization. From out there in Bridgeland, from out there in the woodlands, in those areas, I'll be looking at, you know, slab on grade with no piers. Structural slab, because of the Atlas 14 Harris County requirements and some of the other counties, these slabs got to be elevated for flooding purposes. So many of the houses in Westview, Bel Air, or inner city nowadays are going structurally. They got a crawl space underneath them. 
So the way you build these things here, of course, you, you put the crawl space here, your garage is at grade. This is your wood floor slab. Underneath is the crawl space. So you got a crawl space to allow the water to go in there. Somebody's calling, so are there new technologies for chemical stabilization? We'll talk about that later, anonymous attendee. Here's a, a precast concrete uh, panels out there on a call space foundation. Great foundation system, crawl space. As long as your piers are deep enough and you got void boxes underneath the grade beams. Uh, this is a house out there in Friendswood. The, the owner didn't want to have any movement. It's a nice big house. Sitting on piers, there's a structural slab system. It's all the steel, the piers. Notice all the big trees that we had to cut to build this. These are the floor, these are the trial pictures. The house has started moving, cracking everything. They put the piers at 10 foot. The geotech said put the piers at 20 foot. The structural engineer put it at 10 foot. And of course it was within the active zone. So the expansive soils grabbed the piers, pushed them up, cracked the slab. Um, here's another house in Braze Heights. A bunch of attorneys live here. Question. Are helical piles better than drill piers? Yes, in some cases they're better, especially if you use a slurry method of construction. Uh, helical piles are a great foundation system. They're more expensive than drill piers. I'm gonna to get to them in a minute. House Embrace Heights, structural slab, crawl space, trial pictures. You got a crawl space, no void boxes underneath the grade beams. Piers are 10 foot. Expansive soils grab the piers and lift them up. Crack the whole house up. House in Seabrook, piers are eight feet. Highly expansive soils, crawl space. These are the original piers. These are leveling piers. Well, spread footings. They're sitting on top of expansive soils. They spent $33,000 to put these in. We told them to have to remove it all and cut the whole piers up and put them on helical piles. To shim those those piers. Structural slab on void boxes. You go out there in the West U, for example, you got these big houses. They got void boxes there. Void boxes sitting on top of you know steel sitting on top of chairs. Here are the void boxes. It's a cardboard void boxes. And um, you dig the beams, put your void boxes in, put void boxes in the grade beams between the piers. You put uh, basically this, this is kind of like a cardboard on top of it to reduce puncture. And you can walk on it. You start putting your vapor barrier in. So those are houses on void boxes. Here's a two-way slab design where you're gonna need void boxes in expansive soils, but you drill your piers, you remove the grass and weeds, 
you drill your piers, then you know you put your plumbing in. You don't necessarily need to go through the beams or anything. There's not going to be any beams on this slab. This is a six, seven inch slab. Put your plumbing in, then you do basically a drop cap system. These are your post tension cables and mild steel. This is where your pier is going to go. Piers, this is your steel. This is temperature steel. This is your steel out there to carry the load. Slab thickness should be six or seven inches. You pour your slab. If you got expansive soils, you got to put void boxes. There's no grade beams. You don't have to go through the grade beams for your plumbing. You don't need to compact that soil. Just enough to carry the weight of the concrete. That's it. So no compaction is required. And uh, there's no uh, digging into the beams because of the plumbing. And you just support everything on, on, on piers. And uh, there's no grade beams. Here's a Telefirma deal, Dallas. Uh, this is a slab that they use over there to drill a hole. They put the piers in like this. These are post tension cables. Notice these indentations here, right there. Those are putting this stuff on top of the piers. You pull your slab. You take that piece of the, the concrete out of, to reach that, uh, basically uh, that area where you uh, had those uh, stuff for the, uh, the uh, for the, uh, they call them pucks, where you put the pucks in. And uh, you pull your slab, you put the screws out there where your pucks are in there and you screw the, the slab up, essentially, Put that in, screw, you turn them. As you do that, it lifts the slab up. You get a bunch of laborers and start moving them. So you see the slab moves up and you create a void underneath it. It's called telefirma for slab. They use them in Dallas. Question, have you seen problems with plumbing? Yeah, we see plumbing. Sometimes these expansive soils move so much, they will break your plumbing. Yes, we see problems with expansive soils and plumbing. You backfill the area caps like that. This is your slab. It's, it's got a six inch void underneath it. Next one is a structural slab on great beams. This is what we use in the heights area. It's a slab. Basically, what you do is you put your great beams in. No piers. You put interior beams in there. It's a structural system. You've got voids in here. If the ground moves, your slab moves. You use them for low-income housing, and a lot of houses in the heights are sitting on it. Because of the uh, Atlas 14 and flooding, a lot of the houses in the inner city are sitting on like spread footings or drill piers or helical piles. And they're sitting up, they got crawl space underneath them. So all these houses are going on crawl space. what they look like. Structural slab with a post tension slab. Here's a lot of developers building houses like this. They put a regular post tension slab out there with interior beams. You know, you got exterior beams, regular post tension, and then put a CMU wall or wood wall. They either use CMU or wood all around it to create a crawl space. So that's a regular post tension slab and you got a crawl space on top of it. 
when you do crawl space, make sure you got positive drainage or you got a sump pump in there. You don't want to have water on, sitting underneath your slab. You want to need a bunch of trash in there. Not acceptable. Hill compiles are great systems to build house, houses on or commercial buildings on top of. There are steel structures with helicals, helixes. You screw them into the ground underneath the foundation. Here's a house going out there in Houston. These are the helicals that are using. You screw them into the ground. See the helicopter and going in there. Yeah, these are the helical systems. You just scroll them to the ground. These are helicals. You drill a hole bigger. You fill it up with concrete to give you more lateral support. Or you put a helicals in a batter to resist lateral movement. Because the helical piles by themselves do not have much lateral resistance. But they're great against uplift due to expansive soils. This is a battered helical system. You put them in your grade beams. These are helicals in here. You got your steel chairs. Convention reinforces slab. We use a lot of convention reinforces slab in the country areas outside Houston. They got interior beams. So they got the beams out there and you got a four inch slab. That's a kind of a makeup on a convention reinforces slab. Plumbing is a problem. When you go out there and put that plumbing in, you tear up your mat, your, your pad. Make sure you go back and compact afterwards with a jumping jack. Nice, great beams. You put your vapor barrier in. Your interior beams. Here's this slab that's ready to pour. Bring the concrete, start pumping the concrete. Make sure your concrete's got a slump of less than four inches. You vibrate it. Here's another slab, residential conventional reinforcer slab. You put your steel in, make sure you got chairs. You pour your concrete. You pull your slab, you finish it. You don't use royal wire mesh because there's no chairs, they end up on the bottom. So don't use royal wire mesh. Use chairs, you pour the concrete like this with the steel like that and the steel ends up in the bottom. It's not a good design and construction. This is not acceptable to pull up on the steel when you pour. Not acceptable steel in the bottom. Here's a picture of the steel all the way in the bottom. And this is not acceptable. They're pouring the concrete on top of vapor barrier. So the concrete is not even in contact with the steel. The idiots, they don't know what they're doing. Post tension slab, we use a lot of post tension slab all over Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. Got interior beams. Maximum beam spacing should not be more than 15 feet. These are the beams out there. You may have run a cable through it here or steel. Here's a makeup. 
You got your cables going, sitting on chairs. This is your live end. This is a dead end. Dead end. He's a live end. Dead end. So you start pulling on the live end. When there's a live end, you start pulling that area on the cables. That's a dead end here. It's a typical post tension cable. Make sure your vapor barrier here is in contact with the great beam. I don't want it to be hanging out. Got to be in touch with the, with the soil. This is not acceptable. It's got to be all the way down. Pour the concrete. Make sure your slump is less than four inches. You pump the concrete in. Start finishing it. Remove the forms usually within 24 hours. The forms around the slab, you can remove them. You start uh, stressing the cables. You don't stand in front of it. Make sure your jack is calibrated. You stress when the concrete is at, at strength of about 2,000 PSI. Elongations in, in more than 10% shall be reported to the structural engineer. Tendons in excess of 100 foot should be stressed from both ends. Here's your jack there, make sure it's got properly calibrated. You measure your elongations. If it's off, you calculate them. If it's off more than 10%, you need to get with your structural engineer. Maybe there's a problem with your anchoring system, something got loose. Initially, you put 33 kips tension on the cables. That puts your concrete in compression. Then with time after wedge seating, it becomes 28.9 kips. Then 26.5 kips. It's called final condition. You cut the end. Grouting the stressing pockets. Prior to installing the grout, the stressing pockets should be clean. Uh, of any dirt, grit, oil, grease that should have good bond attained between the concrete and the grout. A bonding agent can be used to enhance the bonding between the grout and concrete. All the loose materials and dirt needs to come out. The recessing pocket shall be filled with non-shrink, non-metallic grout as soon as possible after tendon stressing and cutting. Under no circumstances, the grout pocket should be left exposed. Under no circumstance shall the grout be pocket be filling with uh, stuff that includes chlorides or other chemicals that's going to uh, damage the steel. You cover the hole. I'm going to talk about the design a little bit by the for the structural engineers. There's a concept called thorn white moisture index. It's based on average or 20 to 30 year rain, rainfall in excess of deficit of average evaporation rates. It's called th thorn weight moisture index. Negative th th thorn weight moisture index means moisture deficit. Like you're in Dallas, no matter how much you rain, it's always dry. So it's in, basically it's got a thorn weight moisture index of zero. Positive means it's got too much water, like Houston, it's got plus 18. So if you go look at Houston, it's plus 18, thorn weight moisture index. Austin or so is about minus 15. San Antonio is minus 15 or so, minus 14. That means there are moisture deficient areas. When you design your slab, you design a proposed construction, that's when the climate goes from extreme dry or extreme wet to extreme wet. For extreme dry to extreme wet, or from extreme wet to extreme dry. That's when the TMI is less than plus 15 and, and greater than minus 15. Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. Cities like Houston, where you got your TMI of 18, climate stays, stays extreme dry or extreme wet, when Houston is usually extreme wet. These are typical design factors for post-tension slab, 
in expansive soils. Minimum grade beam depth, one foot, bearing pressure, 1,015 foot. Depth of root fibers, 15, 15 foot. Edge moisture distance, 4.8, 6.1 for center lift, and 4.8 for the edge lift. An edge lift of 1.8 and 2.0, PI of 62. In Houston, your edge lift is usually smaller than the center lift. And it's a post equilibrium design and your PVR is 4.4 here. This is for grade beam of one foot and grade beam of 2.5 foot deep. The deeper your grade beam depth is, your, your, your PVI, uh, your PTI values are gonna be smaller. Here's 1.8 and 2.0, here's 1.6 and 1.8. Bearing capacity. Residential foundation usually do not fail in bearing. Apply bearing pressure based on bearing area of the rib plus 16 times the slab thickness for the interior rib and six times the slab thickness for exterior ribs. So this is your bearing area, 16 T. T. Your T is your slab thickness. So your slab is four inches, 16 times four. That's your bearing area. Okay, and at the, at the parameter is 60. So that's six times the thickness of the slab. So if it's four inches, that's 24 inches. Your beam may be only 10 inches, but your bearing area is actually 24 inches. Effect of trees on design. When you go out and take a tree out in a wooded site and you want to build a house, you take those trees out, you're changing the suction. Suction is a soil energy, basically, uh, soil suction may be described as ability for an unsaturated soil to attract and retain water. These are for engineers. You know, initial uh, equilibrium suction is about 3.4 in Houston. You go from equilibrium to, to uh, in this case, to dry and equilibrium to wet when you got for edge lift and center lift. But when you have trees, you go all the way from the dry conditions because trees suck the moisture out go from a dry to a wet condition. So your Y sub M is gonna be a lot bigger. So if you got a site where it's all trees and you got expansive soils, you take the trees out. If you do not consider the effect of trees, your Y sub M is 1.4, 1.6 for a PI of 40. But as soon as you take the trees out, your Y sub M is 5.3, 1.6 within one year, zero year. After one year, it's 2.5 and 1.6. So you got to design for these things. You got to design for trees. This is a PVR of 2.6 inches. If your PVR 4.7 and PI of 67, your, your Y sub M's are 1.8 and 2.0 with no tree consideration. Once you take that tree out, your edge lift jumps to 10.8. You got to design for it, which means that you cannot do a post tension slab. You got to go use piers or you got to do chemical injection or you gotta do moisture conditioning. Chemical injection, you can go out there on the side. This is a Cinco Ranch, not Cinco Ranch, Sienna Plantation. You go inject the area with chemicals to depth of 10 feet. When you do that, your edge lift drops to 1.2 and 1.4 for PI of 62. Waffle slab, this is another type of slab that we use in Austin and also we use them in California, Mexico. You go mow the grass out there, you put vapor grass, vapor barrier there. First, these plastic boxes, you put them in, you line them up like that. These becomes your beams. You don't have to excavate the beams. This is all above ground like that. If you got plumbing, you move one of the boxes. Pour concrete. Okay, that's how your slab looks like. These are your cables, then you go, you stress them. Then you grade it. If you wanna have less moisture going under your slab, you can saw cut the soil and put fabric in it. That makes your beam deeper or you can do a ditch witch. And then you put a fabric in there, make your beams five foot deep. 
that effectively reduces your slab design. Chemical stabilization, you got lime pressure injection, lime slurry, you got the lime, you mix it in with water in a tank like this, you inject it into the soil, does cation exchange, remo removes sodium, and potassium, puts calcium in there, makes the soil less expansive. It's called chemical injection, lime slurry pressure injection. You go down to 10 feet in Houston, you go to Dallas, San Antonio, you go 20, 30 feet deep. Or you can do a chemical injection, which is a sulfuric acid type. You mix it in tanks like this. You take it to the job site, you pump it in and you inject it into the soil. These are chemical injection. You go all the way down to 10 foot deep. That way you can reduce your PVR. This is the whole, you do chemical injection. Soil types where chemical injections are good, the soils that they got a lot of cracks in, like in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. We have some cracks in our soils too. That allows that chemicals to travel throughout the this, this, this soil to, to, to chemically react with the soil to reduce the PVR. Timber piles, on a lot of projects in Galveston, Near the coastline, we use timber piles. These are round piles or 10, 16 inch pre stress concrete. I mean, 10 or to 16 inch piles. They've got to be treated. These are 10 inch square. You drive them into the, into the ground. Harris County wants to use them in some of their houses in, in their cities. I don't know how they do that. This is a hammer. You drive the piles into the ground. Don't use a backhoe to drive them in. Make sure they're not cracked, not acceptable. You can do this with fiberglass. You can drive them in, vibrate them in. They're great systems. You can fill them up with concrete. You can vibrate them or you can drive them into the ground. You can drive them in. Pre-stressed concrete piles on big projects. You can use these pre-stressed concrete piles. You drive them into the ground, big end bearing, skin friction. You can put your big structures on them. Here's the Aggie guy, put them in an angle to resist lateral loading. This is how you drive the piling in third world countries. Doesn't have much of a capacity. When you drive the piles, use textile section uh, spec 404. Your refusal is 120 blows per foot. If you do pilot holes or jetting, you may lose your skin friction. Use a pilot hole to be able to drive the piles deeper to resist the skin friction. Four inch less than the diagonal of the square pile, one inch less than the diameter of the round pile. So if, if you're using piling for a house, if you're using these techniques, you may have to do reduce the skin friction. When you do jetting, basically uh, it's a 2.5 inch diameter pipe, 150 PSI, drive the pile a minimum of one foot below it or 100 blows per foot. And when you use a hammer for timber piles, you go 330R, which is the load. So if you're this thing is a 20 kit pile, it's 20 times 330, 60,000 foot pound is your hammer energy. Here's some the beaches, beach houses that they're doing a Harvey, got messed up. They didn't have the piles deep enough. They had scour underneath them. They all got tilted. Constantly we're telling these guys in Galveston, they need a soil test and pot capacities for their piles. They don't listen. They just go drop piles and put houses on top of it until you get a hurricane, the thing falls apart. 
poor construction practices. Check the form layout, make sure it is correct, level and square. Look at the brick line here. Look at the drainage around here. You got the PT cables in the water here. Bad drainage, lots of trash on the site. These are some bad construction practices. Foundation makeup, they did this in my land area. They set up to put the piers in, to put this thing, vapor barrier in. They got a big rain. The whole thing fell apart. They had to go back and redo the whole thing. So in general, it's important to do proper geotechnical work when you do your work. If you don't, this is the cost of the attorneys going out there. We've got foundation failures. Any questions for this segment? We got another segment coming up. Any questions? The next segment is quality control. We're gonna take a five minute break here and we're gonna start at 2.30. So I'm taking a five minute break to go out there and drink some water. Okay, in this segment of the program, we're gonna be talking about quality control and construction of residential foundations. Back in the old days, we had the Romans, the quality control, here are the guys over here. If you screwed up, your concrete was bad, they'll stab you with the spears. Of course, right now, if you, you know, bad concrete, you get the lawyers. Uh, on site prep, you take out all the uh, grass, weeds, existing foundation, paving, establish good drainage, compact the soils to 95% of standard proctor density. This is a sheep's wood roller, you compact that soil. If you got soils wet, you're gonna aerate them, open it up, fly ash it, lime it. If you got the clayey soils, fly ash it. When you got sandy soils, remove and replace with dry structural fill. Yeah, somebody's asking, uh, what do you recommend we encounter pump, pumping soils? Uh, give me a few minutes, I'll, I'll go over that. In small areas, get the bags of lime essentially and dry up the area, small areas. Get some lime in there and just soaks up the moisture. So when you go out there and start building your house, you've got to cut out those trees and weeds. 
take the roots out. These all these big roots here, they need to come out. All the roots, anything bigger than half an inch needs to come out. Not, nothing more than half an inch. This whole area here, low area, you gotta have to demuck it, backfill it with structural fill. Don't put sand in here. Take all the tree trunks, roots out up to half an inch. All this needs to come out. All the roots needs to come out. Here's a big tree out there. You see all the roots all around it. All these roots needs to come out. Don't push the dirt in there. You're gonna have to go in there and compact that soil and lifts and bring it up. You cannot go out and get that hole filled up with dirt. You cannot have root organics in there. All these roots, you cannot put them in the building pad. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Not acceptable. All the root organics used to come out. Take them off site. You cannot deliver fill to the site that's all it's got these organics in it. This is not acceptable. Perch water table pump, pump, pumping conditions in the areas where you got sand over clay or silt over clay. Water just sits out there. It saturates that sand. Regular water table is about 20, 30 feet deep. Perch water table is near the surface. You take out those trees and that area starts pumping. Water just sits on top of the clays. Uh, so if you go out and dig your beams, it's getting filled up with water. You got to pump all this water out. There's a pumping soil there. You got that pumping soils in the Woodlands area, Katy area, Ridgeland area, Cinco Ranch, Fulcher. Uh oh, we got a problem here. Let's see what happened. Uh, So here's the pumping soil. So that's where you get your truck stuck. Out there, the truck gets stuck out there in the pumping soil. Auto-improved sites that are pumping. You can improve the drain oh, well. You can open it up to dry up. Uh, you can improve the drainage. Uh, you can do soil mixing. You can do chemical soil modification, removal and replacement. So you can open it up first. Let it dry up. As you do that, you open up the area get sunshine and of course dry up. Of course, if you get a bunch of rain, it kills the whole deal. You improve the drainage. You go out there on the site and dig out some of these bleeder ditches. It drains the sand and silt water. You put them in a grid, it drains the area. And, uh, as it drains it, you take it to a, like a detention pond. Then you pump it into your neighbor's property. Mix the on-site soils and sands with silt and clays. So if you got a pumping soil, you get some of these clay soils from detention pond or from the areas where you excavate for your channels. Some of that clay, you mix it, you take it to the site and mix it and uh, grade it, 
with the sandy soils, you disc it. You pulverize it and you can compact it. That will reduce your pumping. You get chemical stabilization. It's expensive. You use fly ash or lime. This is a hydrated lime you can use, dry. That way you don't have to use as much water or you put the fly ash in there. This is a quick lime here. Quick lime is even better. It soaks up all the water. It's really dry. I don't recommend slurry because it's got too much moisture already in it. You can fly ash, or, you know, if you've got sandy soils, it's pumping. There's a lot in here that's pumping. We go in there and uh, here's the sandy soils. You bring in the fly ash. Here's the sand, you can tell. You put the fly ash in. You mix it in. After you mix it in, you bring in the water and you start use the fly ash mixed with sand. You water it, that makes it hard. Then you go out there and compact it with a steel drum roller or a sheep's foot. And then check for density. Fly step check. You dig a hole, you put some phalon phalon in it, it turns purple when you have fly ash. So you can tell how deep you fly stabilize that lot. You can go out there, if your soil is pumping, you can remove all the sandy soils, bring in structural fill, and compact it. It's expensive, not very good idea. You can disc it. Now disking. Here, sometimes on projects, we've got big chunks of clay. So if that's the case, you disc it before you compact it. You got to get them to one less than one eighth of one half an inch in, in, in size. Proof rolling. Before you build your house, you got to proof roll the area. You go out there and get a loaded dump truck something about 25 tons, 50 tons. You go back and forth. This is not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable, not acceptable. The areas, of course, where you don't have proof roll, the soft areas in turn to a pothole. Earthwork for a single house. This house was pumping the soils, cypress wood area. They took out all the sandy soils, stockpiled them. This is where all the sand was. They proof roll it, the hard pan. Bring in select fill. Compact it and check the density. Compaction, you should compact the soil, clayey soils with sheep's foot. Sandy soils with still drum roller, it vibrates, it densifies the sand. You grate with a dozer. You seal it with a pneumatic roller so that the water doesn't get in. See, this is a seal, this is a compacted with the sheep's foot. This is the pad compacted with a sheep's foot. You go in there and seal it with a you know, steel drum roller so that the water doesn't get in. This is the pad, it's got low areas, not acceptable. This is one of our technicians, Mr. Patch. And you see that they rejects the pad. Here's the house pad construction. They go out there, here's the site, it's all heavily wooded. They go out and clear the area, take out the trees.
Then they go out there, take all the grass and weeds out, start grading it. After grading it, it drains. They had a low area, gets filled up with water. It's not good, it messes up your pad. You gotta pump this out. It's all wet. They start bringing fill and proof rolling it. Once they start proof rolling it, the truck gets stuck, fails the proof roll. Once they compact it and pass the proof roll, they bring in the fill. Compact it with the sheep's foot. Start building the pad up. Set the forms. Start doing the plumbing. Compact after the plumbing. Set the makeup for the slab. Pour the slab. PVR for post tension slab or conventional reinforced slab should be less than 4.5 inches. If your PVR is greater than 4.5 inches, you got to put select fill on the side on the lots or conduct moisture conditioning. Select fill, you bring in fill to your lots, select fill, low PI soils that doesn't expand and shrink, non expansive soils and you compact it and build your pad. Or on a lot of subdivisions, we're doing moisture conditioning. Here's a lot for a subdivision. Soils vary in the subdivision, even the, they vary on a lot. On one lot, your PVR may be five inches and also three inches. That's how the soils vary. Here are the soils of PVR of 5.5, 5.1. You go next to it, you got 4.9. You know, you got 5.5, 4.7, 4.2, 4.7. They're all over the map, you know, 5.2. That's the PVR map of the lots. You compact that soils to get the PVR to less than four and a half inches at optimum plus 5%. So you go out there, compact that soils, add water to it, compact 95%. You got to compact within five foot of the slab, past the slab areas, add water to it. You cover it with a moisture barrier to keep the moisture in place. So you go in there, you add water to your pad. Then you compact it when it's wet. You compact it. Make sure you compact 5% wet of optimum. So if your optimum is 11, the maximum of dry density is about 120. You compact at about 15, 16% on the wet and cover the area, the moisture conditions with plastic sheeting to keep the moisture constant. Okay. What is the recommended PVR for a conventional reinforcer slab on grade with, with grade beams? Maximum PVR for a conventional reinforced slab in no piers is 4.5 inches. So this is how you do moisture conditioning. Lot drainage, you wanna have positive drainage away from your lots. Good drainage is very important. You got positive drainage on your pad. This is Tavola, you can see positive drainage. Positive drainage towards the street. Between the houses, you got a swale. Quality control, soil, concrete, and drill piers. This is your pad out there you're gonna build the houses on. You gotta make sure you got properly compacted pads. You need to have density tests for every lift for your pad. God knows how many lawsuits I've been involved in. They're looking for densities. They can't find them. We keep our densities for about 10 years. 
because that's the statue of repose. They can have them for about 10 years. So it's make sure you have all your densities in one place. So if you do the densities, we keep in our files for 10 years so that you can produce it anytime you need it. These are the paths in Kingwood. You get a proctor sample of the fill, proctor of the natural soils, 50 pounds each, put them in buckets. It's a natural soil and get your fill from like, from a, basically from a, a pit. So this is a pit here. You got sandy soils and you got sandy clay. The soils are in a pit are variable. And so it's very important that uh, you, depending where you get your material from a pit to get a good soil. You get a backhoe, you get your material from the pit, which is a big hole in the ground. You put it in the back of the truck. This is sandy clay. And take it to the job site where you put in a hopper. So this is natural soils. This is natural soil, this is fill. This is natural soil proctor. You get a sample of it, 50 pounds. You dry it up, chop it to pieces. You add water to it at different moisture. You compact it in, with this device or you can compact it with the machine. It's a 5.5 pound hammer, drop 12 inches, 25 blows per lift, three lifts. This is how you compact it in the mold. That's how you compact it with the machine. You get, you know the volume of it, you weigh it. You know the volume, you get the density of it. This is optimal moisture. You develop maximum density. If you get soils well wet, the moisture increases, your soils becomes wet. Your density will go down. If your moisture comes low, your soil becomes dry, your moisture will go down. This is optimal moisture. This is your strength. At near optimum, you develop maximum strength. Compact that soil in your pad with a jumping jack. Or you can have a, use a steel drum roller or sheep's foot, small one. And you compact that soils in your form. Dig your beams, make sure they're nice and clean. Do not use sand in your forms. Sands are permeable, they take the water everywhere. So if you're in Pearland, do not use sand. If you're in the woodlands, you can use sand because there's sandy soils out there already. But don't use sand out there in Pearland. This is your pad there. You set your forms. Watch out for these uh, plumbing stuff that just tear up everything. You gotta go behind the uh, plumbing guys and compact your soils around the plumbing lines. Nice and clean gray beams. Take the trash out of the gray beams. You run a density test per lift. This is a density test. You poke a hole in the ground with this rod. You put, this is the hole right there. You put your nuclear gauge on top of it. You run the rod. You put your nuclear source inside the hole. This is the rod that goes inside. It's got cesium-137 in its gamma ray. You got a receiver here. It gets these photons. The more you get, a lot of photons, your density is low. If you get little photons, your density is good. That's how you determine. It takes a minute to get your densities. You measure your densities and you tell the contractor if the compaction passes. You want to compact 95% of standard proctor density. Optimum is 11 at moisture contents plus and minus 2% between 9 and 13%. 95% of 122 is about 115. So your minimum density should be 115 PCF pounds per cubic foot. What's your content of 11%? You dig your beams. Take the chunks out, the trash out. Nice and clean beams. This is bad. You don't dig out and throw the loose materials inside the forms. This is a pretty bad construction. You don't put it in there. Look at the steel here, all busted. 
poor construction here. You're going to use a lot of concrete here. It's not good. Okay, the grade beams are not square. Take out the excess soil off the pad. Put your vapor barrier in. This is not a good vapor pad in here. It's just a soak with water, not acceptable. Here's another vapor barrier pad situation. You got a 26 inch slumped tree in the pad, six to eight inch slump stumps out in the pad. Pecan tree right next to the pad, 26 inch tree stump in the, in the beam. All the stumps needs to come out. You cannot leave any stumps in there. Sometimes they put this uh, forms out there for your grade beams, nice and neat. This contractor put a, um, uh, a uh, put this tent over here to uh, prevent the rainfall and start digging your beams, the beams and all that, but they got a thunderstorm, the whole thing blew over. So it wasn't that effective. This is the GHBA building next to it, next to GHBA building, they set the forms. They let it sit, they put the plumbing in, the grass start growing in, and they went out and poured the concrete. They built this church, not acceptable. Remove grass and weeds before setting the forms. He was out there in Tavola. This guy goes in there, set the forms, and dig the beams in the grass. Not acceptable. You can't do that. You can't go out there and put your slab in there and set the forms. You can see the grass in there, in the beams. This is a lawsuit waiting to happen. They have the grass in there, not acceptable. Correct field type and placement. Don't use sand in your forms. This is Pearland, heavily wooded site. They go out, take out all the trees. They put a bunch of sand in there, not acceptable. Okay, you gotta put select fill in there or structural fill. All the plumbing should be backfilled with structural fill. All the plumbing should be backfilled. This is the elevation by the developer when they got the lot. These guys are building the pad for the slab. They raise it 30 inches, no compaction. That's not acceptable. Not acceptable. And look at the clay in here. They got gumbo clay in there. This is not select fill. If you look at it, is gumbo clay and some sand around it. Concrete, we're fixing to get cold in here. Do not put concrete if the temperature below 40 degrees. Normal concrete can pray, presume if the ambient temperature is 50 degrees more than half a day. If you pour concrete with the concrete, when the temperature is low, you develop low strength, low strength gain with time, Void spaces in the concrete because when the concrete freezes, it expands and you're going to have a lot of voids in concrete. It reduces the rate of hydration. It affects the durability. So you need to make sure your concrete gets about 500 PSI. And, and then, uh, you know, if the temperature drops for one cycle, you're okay. So place the concrete when the temperature of the concrete between 75 and 100 degrees if the temperatures, if the, the weather is hot. Make sure you check the temperature of the concrete, 75 to 100 degrees. If it's really hot, concrete, it really increases the uh, water demand for it to have workability. You're gonna have accelerated slump loss, increased rate of setting, increased tendency for plastic shrinkage cracking, difficulties in controlling entrained air, Critical need for prompt curing. Lower strength, decreased durability, non-uniform surface appearance, increased tendency for shrinkage cracks. New concrete after rain, if it rains, it washes out your cement. You just have the aggregates not acceptable. You have to jackhammer this and pour new concrete. When you pour concrete out there, you take that concrete to a pump truck, out there, start pumping the concrete in. Make sure your slump is less than four to five inches. 
you finish it, you vibrate it. Make sure you got chairs. It's vibrating it. If you got a big slab, you got to saw cut it at 15 foot spacing. You saw cut one fourth. It's called control joints. You tell the concrete where to break, to crack. You usually do it about eight to 12 hours after you pour the concrete. That's why you saw cut on the larger slab. You don't do it on a 3,000 foot slab. If you're doing a 10,000 square foot slab, you do it. You saw cut it one fourth of the thickness of the slab. Tells the concrete where to crack. You don't do this on a post tension slab. You do this on a conventional reinforcement slab. Slump test. You want to make sure your slump is less than four or five inches. This is the cone. You put the concrete in three layers. You rot it. Three layers, 25 blows. You pull it up. You measure the slump. If you slump more than five inches, you reject it. This is a slump 11 inches. Not acceptable. Too much water in the concrete. It develops shrinkage cracks. Okay, crack. We've got a question. Can you explain again why in some areas it is not acceptable to have sand layer below concrete slab? Like I, like I said, you don't want to put sand under the slab in areas that are ex have expansive soils. So if you're out there in Rosenberg, if you're out there in West Sioux, Bel Air, Pearland, all the areas where you got expansive soils, you don't go in there and fill your forms with sand because sand is permeable. It takes the water inside the slab areas where the trees were, and the whole area will start heaving, and your slab starts cracking. This is an 11-inch slump concrete. Here's a one-inch slump concrete. It's not acceptable, not enough water. What does this mean? It says five. They tell the guy over here, concrete truck guy, add five gallons of water. If you add one gallon of water to one yard of concrete, for every one yard, gallon of water to one yard of concrete, you increase the slump by one inch. One gallon of water reduces the compressive strength by 250 PSI. One gallon of water would waste 25% cement. One gallon of water increases shrinkage by 10%. One gallon of water increases permeability by 50%. One gallon of water reduces the freeze-thaw resistance by 20%. One gallon of water reduces salt scaling resistance. One gallon of water increases cracking by 10%, increases air content by 1%, segregation, all the big stuff goes in the bottom and then get the fines on the surface. Uh, you know, dusting, durability, increases finishing time. It's not worth the expense. Here's a concrete that's had too much water in it. This is a trial video. They had to suck, basically jackhammer it and remove it and put a new slab in. Making concrete cylinders on job sites when they pour that concrete. Uh, we make concrete cylinders that they pour the concrete. You put them in a, basically in containers like this. These are concrete cylinders, about 12 inches, height six inches in diameter. Fill them, fill them in into three layers, rot them 25 times. You rot it 25 times. You clear the top. Put a cap on it, remove it from a job site in a cylinder holder within 24 hours or 48 hours. Put them in a curing room. Let them cure 100% humidity. You break them at seven days and 28 days. Your concrete should have a 3,000 PSI at 28 days usually. Okay, if it doesn't pass, then what you need to do is core that concrete. Make sure you got the proper thickness. You cap it. You take it to the lab and you break that concrete 
and hopefully yes, it will have 3000 PSI. You can also check the concrete strength by Swiss hammer. Uh, basically it's a device, it's got a spring in it. You push it into the concrete, you, you level the concrete, you push it in there. And uh, it tells you what kind of strength it has by correlation. It overestimates concrete strength. You can also do Windsor Pro, it's a gun. You shoot a bullet into the concrete. So you set up the area here, you put the bullet in the concrete, you shoot it in there based on the type of aggregates and penetration depths. It tells you what kind of a strength it has. And last section, of course, here is the peer inspection. Dry method of construction. You got your bell, your underream, you drill the holes with the drill, with the, with the drill. These are the drill, basically, augers. Augers. This is the bell tool. Make sure you got the right size bell. You open it up. Make sure you got the proper depth. So if you're in West U, your pier got to be 18, 20 foot deep. Make sure you got the depth. Don't miss on the depth. You make sure you don't have water in it. If you have water, no more than three inches. Make sure you check the hand penetrometer. You got proper strength. If it's soft, you got to inside enlarge the bell. You put a bell tool in there. Measure the bell size. Put the cage in. You pour the concrete. Make sure it doesn't hit the side. Drill the hole, dry method. Drill the hole, put the steel casing in, trimming the concrete down. Now, in some cases where you got sandy soils, you got paving problems, you go out there and drill the hole. You put your casing in, it's a steel casing pipe. You put it in a hole, you drill through it. You get the soil out. Check the hand penetrometer, you get the bell in there, reamer, you make the bell, then you put the cage in, steel, you put the concrete in, then you pull the casing out. That prevents caving. Now, if you got water problems, of course, you trim the concrete. This is a funnel, you pour the concrete through the funnel. This is a slurry method that you need to be aware of that you got to use in West U, Bel Air, Meyerland, Race Heights, Pearland, Rosenberg. You drill the hole with mud. It's a bentonite, about 8% with water, about 65 pounds per cubic foot, or maybe 70 pounds per cubic foot. Unit rate, you mix it in a, in, in a, in a device like this. It's a mud pit. Okay, and then you go out there and you drill your hole with it. It keeps the hole open, the hydrostatic pressure from the mud keeps the hole open. You put your pier in, straight shaft, you put your steel in. You pump your concrete. As you pump the concrete, concrete is 150 pounds per cubic foot. It replaces the, the, the drilling mud. The drilling mud sticks to the sand, keep it from caving problems. These are the bit nice sticks in there. The hydrostatic pressure keeps the hole from collapsing. You drill the hole, you introduce the drilling mud, you put your cage in, you uh, put the concrete in with a trimmy, the mud comes in the sump and recycle it. That's the end of the presentation. If you got some pictures of the projects, please send them to me. I'll appreciate it. Uh, I want you to tell me how you like the program. So I'm going to send you a poll. You tell me how you like it. Please respond to the poll. If you need to reach me, my name is David Eastwood. My email is de at geoteching.com. Phone number is 699-4000. We got a couple of programs coming up. Uh, October 14th, we got evaluation and foundation distress and causation for distress in structures. So it tells you about failures of the slabs and houses and buildings. And we got a four hour presentation for GHBA coming up in November. So if you want to register for this uh, October program, please send me your email with your information so that we can put you on a database so that you get it. Questions?
So if you have any questions, ask me. Thank you for your time today. I guess uh, if you need any soil tests, please give us a call. Uh, we can do the geotechnical work, material testing, environmental for you, and uh, forensics. So we're going to have the forensic program coming up. Um, if you have any questions,